Chapter 3, we're looking at properties of solutions, which are homogeneous mixtures. As an instructor here, reflecting for a moment on prior knowledge, um, we've already considered strong, weak, and non-electrolytes in the solutions that they uh, make back in Chapter 4. We looked at the behavior of gases, primarily ideal gases, thought about intermolecular forces, and discussed enthalpy. As an instructor, my prior knowledge, I also have insights involving entropy and Gibbs free energy. But as you see within chapter three, there's sort of a, a tap dance around that. Those ideas are still coming uh, later in the book. So chapter three is a little bit challenging to try to, um, in some ways, use some of those ideas, even though we really haven't explored them yet. So uh, as we step through this, the idea that um, we're going to be making solutions, discussing solvent and solutes, first reflecting on when we're making a solution, what kind of observations or measurements can we make? So I'm trying to prime here their understanding of macroscopically, what can we measure when we're making a solution? Within our chemistry triplet here of the macroscopic, the submicroscopic, and the symbolic, I'm trying to think about that. What are the macroscopic measurements? There's different ways we could explore this, um, and I probably have already explored it with my class involving FET sims. I've definitely used this sugar and salt solution sim within that simulation. Uh, macroscopically, one could measure conductivity if you're adding salt to water. Contrast that with adding sugar. Notice that's within this macroscopic tab. There's also a microscopic tab. That's showing what's taking place at the particle level. I used this back in chapter four when I'm discussing strong, weak, and non-electrolytes. Considering how they dissociate, what that means in terms of the concentration, what happens when there's a polyatomic ion involved. This is a good sim to play with. You can adjust the uh, amount of liquid let it out the bottom, add it to the top, and then consider what's taking place um, at the particle level with the intermolecular forces present, showing partial charges for the water, how an ionic compound dissociates, and how a molecular one like sugar dissociates. There are other sims that look at ideas of the macroscopic behavior. Perhaps you've looked at Beer's Law. In this case, we see that the intensity of the solution is changing. If we want to think about that in terms of the concentration, as more solute is added. Again, the macroscopic observation would be the color of the solution, the intensity of the solution, and how with subsequent diluting it, we can be changing its appearance. The FET sim on pH scale, that's another example where there are macroscopic observations. Maybe it's the appearance of the solution. Maybe it's a measurement like the pH. My goal once again here is not to really be discussing pH, but to be considering what macroscopic observations we can make. So uh, usually this is something that we um, see the different ideas that the class has. And here's a, different examples of the kinds of observations that we can have when we're making a solution or describing a solution. And now we're going to begin to look more closely at what's taking place with the solution, what takes place during the, the, the process. Looking first at the uh, tendency towards mixing, a couple leading questions. Are there significant attractions between gas molecules and what would happen after the barrier is removed? So I have gas particles on each side. We've already been looking at the behavior of ideal gases. I'd say there are not significant attractions between the gas molecules and what happens after the barrier is removed. They just disperse, they spread out upon mixing, they move into both chambers. The FET semi-reversible reactions is one that I use to 
illustrate this. I use it sim when I'm discussing entropy later on. And you notice then this is sort of a beginning to introduce what ta takes place involving the entropy change. Particles on each side. If we remove the barrier, we see the dispersal, the spreading out of the particles into both sides of the container. They're mixing together. That's what's being described here as a natural tendency towards mixing. In this case, I would say the enthalpy change was not important because in this case, we don't have significant intermolecular attractions between the gas particles. But we know that we will have examples where we have significant attractions and enthalpy will be important because we know about different intermolecular forces and how we may have to identify, for example, whether a molecule is polar or not by doing an analysis of the Lewis structure and considering the best for predicted geometry. Reviewing the different intermolecular forces we've already discussed. Now when we're comparing solutions, we have this idea that we can mix together gases, but we have other even more interesting mixtures. Other things can be taking place. Perhaps they don't mix together at all. Maybe there's a temperature change. Maybe there's a limit to how much dissolves. The simplest within this is they just mix together. And we're going to see that entropy is an important factor in that. But these other cases, we have the enthalpy also being important. So we have a lot of interesting chemistry here. So if I'm explaining that spontaneous mixing, I think that thinking about the entropy change would explain the mixing here of gas with a gas. In these cases here on the left, I think that the enthalpy change would also be important. This is a good discussion point then. Why would the enthalpy also be important? Well, quite simply, I, I see matter sticking together. There's going to be energetics involving separating the matter and when the matter is coming together and it's attracted. So in these cases, I think the enthalpy will be an important concern, but it's not for a gas. Thinking about solution formation at the particle level, there's a difference when we're talking about uh, something like sodium chloride and something like our sugar. If you recall, this is what we saw within the that sim moments ago. So we have a particle level description for what's taking place. So let's revisit this in terms of our intermolecular attractions. What kinds of attractions were found in the solute between the solute and the solvent, excuse me, the solvent with the other solvent particles and the solute with the solvent? These are the different ones that we want to consider. So for the salt on the left, if the salt is considered to be the solute. It's an ionic compound. How about with the um, sugar? In that case, examples of uh, hydrogen bonding and dispersion forces as well. Doubling back, this was our structure here for the sugar. What about between the solvent with the solvent? Well, then we're talking about um, the water where hydrogen bonding and dispersion are going to be important factors there. And then resulting between the solute and the solvent. In one case, it's ion dipole interactions. The other case, aspects of hydrogen bonding and dispersion once again. So we're trying to see that we have three different types of interactions there. That last one is considered the hydration when the water, the solvent then, is enveloping the solute. If we look at the overall energetics then, this is an example where it's exothermic. The idea here that the overall enthalpy change involves the energy to take apart the solute, take apart the solvent, both of those are endothermic, and then the resulting coming together as they mix together, which is the exothermic. An example would be calcium chloride. This is an exothermic example. Exothermic, the solution is going to feel hot, temperature goes up, and the delta H for the solution is negative, having combined all of these enthalpy terms. Here's what it looks like if it's an endothermic change. Ammonium nitrate's an example. Macroscopically, endothermic means it's going to feel cold. The overall enthalpy change now is unfavorable when it's endothermic. So in this case, in order to explain the spontaneous solution formation, entropy must be favorable in this case. 
summary of that particular section. The different cases then if we entropy is or is not important. Clearly what I'm trying to do in here is I'm taking a, a baby step in the direction of introducing the concept of entropy and Gibbs free energy. That's my own prior knowledge and that's what I'm trying to introduce within that section when entropy is or is not important in the solution process.